Uh, what's your most memorable Dr. J move or um, story? Probably the camp that he did in Lansing, where he started all the way down at the other end of the court. And he had all the kids stand up and clap. Uh -huh. And I ain't lying. I swear to God. <laughs> that man jumped. It looked like to me from about the top of the key. <laughs> and he was just in the air. Ooh. And then it looked like he just stopped. And he said, come on. You in the air now. <laughs> there was a time when history was chronicled by word of mouth. And the stories that were passed down from one generation to the next were called legends. Through the ages, they grew and grew. Today, Legend is an overused word. And in the world we live in, where history is recorded in every way you could imagine, they can't really exist anyway. But if you look hard enough, you could still find them out there. Maybe the very last of their kind. So there's a rumor out there that you can still dunk. Who's spreading the rumor? Me? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have the ticket stub to prove it, you probably never saw Julius Irving when he changed the game of basketball. You had to rely on someone else to tell you just how great Dr. J was. The legend's incredible. The real story is even better. He was Michael Jordan before there was a Michael Jordan. I think I do try to emulate him. Everybody wanted to be like the doctor. Who's your favorite basketball player? Dr. J. Dr. J could do things in today's game guys cannot do. The doctor, he got it! The legend preceded him wherever he went. Doctor's bad. You heard it? Greatest play I've seen in a long time. But chances were you couldn't see it. I can't show you how he did it, but believe me, he did it. Julius jumped over his head. Irving, we always looked at Dr. J as like an alien. He was the coming of a new age. Julius truly was a legend, but the entertainment, my friend, is in the style. Who are you? Uh... <laughs> are you someone important that we should know about? Uh, I used to play professional basketball. Oh, did you? Well, you are pretty tall. Yeah. So it's not really I'm actually that. leaning right now. <laughs> I you know, right now. Did, did you, you, how how did you play for? I uh, played for the Nets when they were in Long Island and 76ers. Okay. And a defunct team called the Virginia Squires. My name's Julius Irving. Julius Irving? Yeah. That's you? It's not you. Are you Julius Irving, really? Are you really? Well, it's not Julius Irving, really. It's just Julius Irving. <laughs> yes. Really? Yeah. Not really. I haven't even heard of you. How are you? Yeah, it's been a long time since coming back. Still home. Long Island's always going to be my home. This is Campbell Park right here. Under the water tower. Campbell Park. I mean, it's the birthplace of basketball for Julius Irving. I had a window in my bedroom that would look across at the park, and I could look out here and see all the kids playing, especially on the weekends. The building's gone, but the essence of it is still there in my mind. Julius Winfield Irving II was born on February 22, 1950, on Long Island, the middle child of Callie and Julius Sr. His parents divorced when Julius was three, and six years later, his father was killed in a car crash. Callie and her three kids lived in a housing project, and Julius's biggest job 
was looking out for his younger brother, Marvin. Marvin was smart, uh, very book smart, but, you know, he was the one who always got sick. He had asthma, and he would always break out with rashes. That made me more protective, uh, you know, subbing in for the father's role and, you know, being more than a big brother. He was a little bookworm, but he was cool. He was, uh, he, he looked up to Julius. He was a great little brother to have. I have great memories of him riding on the handlebars of my bike, because we were very adventurous. We would take a drop line and fish in the lake and fish for sunfish and, uh, and bring them home and mom would cook them up. But there was no doubting the brother's favorite place to play, right outside their door. Campbell Park was a special place for me. We probably went there every day. I mean, even when it snowed or rained, if it snowed, you shovel snow and you play basketball. But apparently one morning was just too cold for Julius and his friend Archie. So they got on their bikes to find a place they could play inside. I was practicing with the basketball team back in 1962. And somebody came in and said, down there are two young men that would like to speak to you. So I went outside and we said, Julius Serving and Archie Rogers. They were both age 12. And they asked me if they could play uh, basketball here at the Salvation Army. And uh, at the time, uh, this area was all white. Nobody on the team but me and Julius was African-American. But we were children and we didn't feel the racism. Archie and I, two black kids and 10 white kids, and we became a team. When Julius was 13, his mom moved the family into a house. He played ball at Roosevelt High School. And thanks to his best friend on the team, he gained something that would stay with him the rest of his life. On the court, I made a point to know all the rules. <laughs> and so, you know, you walked, you depart, you know, I, I was ready to make a call. If your ball went out off his leg, he'd always make an excuse. You know, you push me, you grab me, you hold on my jersey. I mean, he was like a professor, you know, weighing you down in the lecture hall. So I started calling him professor. So I said, well, what do you know? I mean, you're here arguing with me. I mean, what are you, like the, the, the doctor? And every time we would see each other, you know, I'd look up to him and I'd say, doctor, professor. And it was just an inside joke. In those days, everyone else called him Jewel on the court, where he wasn't much more than a good player who went out of his way to blend in. I remember one time, it was a fast break, and he was in the front of the break, and he stopped to pull up to wait for the rest of us to get down court. And Coach just got up and screamed at him. What are you doing? Bust him! By his senior year, Julius was only six foot three. He'd become one of his team's best players, but drew little college interest. Only one scout even bothered to see him play. Here's Julius after I saw him play, and I rated him a four, which isn't bad, you know. But don't forget now, I'm rating him here as a six, three and a half forward guard. That's not a bad rating because he had no rating. No one thought he was going to be that good. No one knew he was alive as a player. But at the playground, Julius was a whole different player. Everything always went well at the park, especially if you would do things that were a little different than the things that the other kids were doing. I had a lot of tricky stuff around the basket, putting it up left-handed, right-handed, jumping over people. And one afternoon on the blacktop, the secret of Julius Irvin got out for the first time. He didn't know that I was there. And Juice is coming out on a fast break, and he was at the foul line. And Julius goes up in the air. I closed my eyes because I thought he wasn't going to be able to go that far in the air. But he just collided. And then he dumped on me. That was beyond my imagination. And he acted like it was no big deal. Coach Wilson had seen enough. He made a call to an old friend who just so happened to be the head coach at the University of Massachusetts. 
And by the next fall at UMass, others have begun to marvel at the freshman who seemed like he could fly. A lot of the kids got a chance to start watching him. And they saw what I saw. Julius was a 6'3 jumper. They jumped like he was seven foot. That was the buzz that went around the school. I had a frequent caller who bombarded me with propaganda about this freshman basketball player at the University of Massachusetts named, quote, Julie Irving. His basketball career was starting to take off, while his connection with his family stayed strong. That February, Marvin came up on my birthday. We spent time on campus in the dorm, and he was complaining about pain in his joints and had a rash. They go home, and he's in the hospital. You know, the doctors were running tests. My mindset is, they're gonna get to the bottom of it, it's gonna be treatable, and then he'll be all right. The doctors diagnosed Marvin with lupus, and over the next three months, his condition deteriorated. My mom calls me, and she says, uh, you need to come back home. He said, Leah, uh, I just got a call from Mom, and Mom is not doing good, and they don't know if he's going to make it through the night. You know, I got to go home. And I said, hey, man, let's, let's go. I'll, I'll drive. He was just quiet. He just was thinking about his brother. The trip was generally a three-plus-hour trip, and we did it in under two. We flew. And he, you know, literally jumped out the car and was running up the stairs. His mother was in the room, and, uh, you know, I heard his mother scream. I just, just cry out. He said, I'm really tired. And, uh... You know, they need to come and get me. And he's talking about the angels. And that was the last thing he said to me. I mean, I go back and, you know, everybody's there at the house. And uh, I just go to my room because I got to be by myself. The things we had done, those journeys to the park, bicycle rides, you know, all of those things were not going to happen again. And the finality of that, it's overwhelming. It just seems so unfair. Sometimes when I dream, I dream about living in the attic with my brother. So this place has come back to me many, many times, and now I'm back at it. In this bedroom with Marvin, we spent a lot of time planning for the future, but He's always going to be 16, you know? Man plans and God laughs. When I went back to school after his funeral, all I could do is take his spirit with me. So when I line up against an opponent, who was only thinking of being one. You know, now I got two spirits in there. I got mine, I got my brothers. I have a slight advantage. By his junior year, Julius had grown to six foot six and averaged 27 points and 20 rebounds a game. But the rules restricted his play because at the time, the NCAA still prohibited dunking. He had to save that for the playgrounds. And after the school year was up, 
he began heading to the most famous playground of them all. Since the 50s, Rucker Park in Harlem had hosted summer tournaments that brought names as big as Wilt Chamberlain and Connie Hawkins to the blacktop to play a version of the game where style was essential to the substance. The first game you got in on this court here and played like a bum, you was a bum. So when Jerry Sherman came to Rucker, he needed to be known in the basketball world as a great player or he would have probably figured out a way to deal with his books and keep his grades high. We played him the first game and they kept saying, you wait till Julius gets here, you wait till Julius. And I'm like, who's Julius? <laughs> I'm in the NBA, but I care about Julius. Tom Hoover had never heard of him, but soon enough the kid named Julius was doing things that no one at the Rucker would ever forget. At the baseline, he dunks, and the guy takes the ball out to throw it the length of the court for a fast break. He jumps up in the air and catches the ball and throws it down. Charlie Scott shot a long shot, and Julius came, took it out of the air, and dunked it. I took it right there. I said, I don't, I don't need to see anything else. This was it. People here in Harlem, they really know good basketball. And, uh, you know, if you, if you do something real nice, you know, they show their appreciation. He came down one time. I had the angle on him. He dunked the ball so bad, the ball hit me in the top of the head. My teeth fell out on the ground. The crowd roared. I had scrambled to grab him off the ground and put him back in my mouth. That helped build his reputation. There was just one thing left for Julius to earn at the Rucker. They would call him different names, uh, Little Hawk. He went over to the announcer and said, I'm not the Little Hawk. That's Connie Hawk. So then they call him the Claw. Oh, man, the Claw's got the ball going. I was like, I'm thinking, I wonder who he's talking about. He's calling me the Claw. I didn't want to be the Claw. They would call him all sorts of names. Oh, what a rebound by Black Moses. Black Moses, what are you talking about? He said, if you want to call me anything, call me the doctor. So you know, they said, well, the doctor is operating tonight. <laughs> All of a sudden, Dr. J, Dr. J, Dr. J. Who's your favorite basketball player? Dr. J. Why? All his moves he do. That's why. Behind me, up on the roof, is a school. They were all on the roof. He drew the greatest crowd in the history of the Rucker Pro League. You had people up in the trees, sitting on branches. Everywhere you looked around, there were people. It wasn't even standing room only. People could not see enough of the game. We had people on the bridges. This is where the legend of Dr. J started. It was 1971. For years now, the playground style of basketball had been growing, though you wouldn't have known it from watching an NBA game. Bradley jumps from 20 and hits. But the upstart ABA, founded in 1967, was a whole different story. We played that street kind of ball, you know, where we pushing it up. Guys get up in the air, they like, oh, let me change it, put it around here. Let me do some of this. Yeah, bam. <laughs> we were entertaining. You know, we come down and dunk on you, you know, come down and make a tricky move. We're playing in a league that endorses discovery. And there, my friends, is the very dramatic brand of basketball which can be enjoyed only in the ABA. We always felt the NBA was that old slowdown ball. They come out, run plays, I mean, you know, come on, man, who wants to see that? It was like the NBA was ashamed of dunking, and the ABA embraced it. There wasn't anything like this, and if you loved basketball, you had to love this. All right, so the question here is, why did you choose the uh, ABA over NBA? Well, I like the colors of the basketball. <laughs> you like that better, huh? Yeah. It wasn't just the red, white, and blue ball that was unconventional. The ABA had the three-point shot, ball girls, and it seemed like any gimmick that would draw more fans into the stands. 
and maybe the boldest idea of all was how the league attracted players away from its older rival by doing one thing the NBA wouldn't, sign college underclassmen and high school players. The ABA would take anybody. If you were an eighth grader and they thought you could play, they'd sign you up. Which led a desperate owner and a desperate league to zero in on the junior from the University of Massachusetts who had torn up the Rucker League. I was in New York for an ABA meeting and they mentioned the fact that there was this player up in New England that was so spectacular, Julius Irving, and I'd never heard of him. And they proceeded to extol all the virtues of how great he'd be in professional basketball. And with that conversation, I moved forward to see if I could sign him to a contract. At this time, I didn't even know who the Virginia Squires were. But my mother probably made six to $8,000 a year, and I was being offered $125,000 guaranteed for four years. You know, the rest was history. To most of the basketball world, Julius Irving was an athletic young prospect and nothing much more. But Dr. J had found a perfect new venue for his game. He was just shackled. And the minute he got to the ABA, he just... Wow! Dr. J! I developed my own style of play, which is a playground style. It's real loose, a real freelance style. There's the man, Julius Irving. I thought I knew Julius Irving as a basketball player. And then I went and watched some guy they called Dr. J. I never saw this guy before. And there is Julius Irving. Look at that move behind the back. All of a sudden, he, uh, he's coming in off the foul line, he's coming in off the wings, he's dunking backwards. It was like watching two different players. Even in the freewheeling ABA, Dr. J dazzled. But if you weren't in the building to witness it, you probably didn't see him in action. You'd hear that, you know, this guy playing for some team in Virginia, the Squires, was flying through the air. And you're like, what? It was, who is he? Most of what we knew about him came from game stories, box scores, maybe a tiny film clip of a given play, and word of mouth. The games just were not televised. My brother was in the Navy in Virginia, and he kept telling me, this kid Irving, man, he's a bad boy. I kept getting newspapers sent to me about this great kid named Julius Irving, who was scoring 28, 29 points a game, and I thought to myself, Julius Irving, finally a great Jewish basketball player. You're hearing these reports, this spectacular, swooping, out of nowhere guy that is just doing things that have never been seen before. Even the NBA was taking notice and coming hard after him to make the switch, something the ABA couldn't afford to let happen. So after two years in Virginia, Squires owner Earl Foreman knew what he had to do. I was as much concerned with his playing for the ABA almost as I was with his playing for the Squires. And I contacted the owner of the Nets and worked out an arrangement. In 1973, Foreman sold the league's leading scorer to the New York Nets. I was in Ocean City, Maryland. I got a call and I said, God, I gotta go back to New York, man. I was just on vacation with my kids and family. And they said, well, I said, what's going on? Well, we just got Dr. J. I said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. The ABA's biggest star was headed to its biggest stage. Julius Irving was going home to Long Island. New York has always been my home, and I'm very pleased and happy that I'll be able to play out my career here. This is New York, Long Island's Nassau Coliseum, home of the Nets. It's past the buck night here, a $5.50 ticket for only a buck. It's also bread night, a free loaf of bread for every fan. But there are only 9,300 fans who pass the buck here, 9,300 fans to see the second place Nets, 9,300 fans, $9,300 to see the fabulous Julius Irving the great Dr. J.
coming back to Long Island, life could not have been better. I mean, it was such great anticipation coming to play basketball in the place where I was born and raised. This building was brand spanking new. I mean, the identity of the Nets now is Brooklyn. But, you know, my time here and my era here, I think was very, very special. The Doctor debuted in New York in October 1973, instantly transforming his hometown team into a contender and doing it with a style that could be defined in just one word. Cool. Dr. J was the epitome of cool. If you look up the definition of cool in the 1970s, it says see Julia serving. And it starts with the afro. It'd be up there so high. That fro used to, you know, kind of like fly in the back. Dr. J wasn't just the coolest man in the building, he was the coolest man in the area code, in the state, in the time zone, in the country. The thing that was so cool about Doc was the size of his hands. His hands are so big that when he holds a ball, it's like him holding a tennis ball. If you went up and tried to block it, I mean, he'd just move it over here and slam it down. So he could do anything with it. And when he would cradle the ball, and be like this on a poster, there'd be a, the face sort of went with it. And if you can get the hair up like that at the same time, he was terrifyingly good. Man, I can't believe that dog. I've never seen one like it. He became a cult figure. Everywhere we went, all they wanted to do was see Julius. If you came to see him play, you was gonna leave there shaking your head saying, man, that kid flat out play. Seven go on, Doc. I played for a coach who said, you know what? We got this game plan. It ain't working. <laughs> you need to do something. <laughs> Here's the doctor. We were playing Kentucky, and Dr. J's on a fast break. And Artis Gilmore, it's a mano a mano. He's waiting for Doc. Now, Gilmore, for people that don't know, is seven foot two with a five foot afro. Doc flew right over him. Gilmore's there. The Doc dunks it. What a play. Whether I was bringing the ball up court or getting it off the board, I was going to determine the outcome of the game. Irving with the basketball inside the half court line goes up. It's a 40-footer in. Oh, 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 in his first season playing just a few miles from where he grew up, Dr. J won the scoring title and his first MVP and carried the Nets to their first championship. He was the king of the ABA, and life was also good off the court. It was a beautiful time. I mean, I have a wife and I have two sons, and I'm very happy, very excited about the prospects for the future with a woman who I adore and who I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And basketball seemed to be taking care of itself. But while the next season brought another MVP award, as the doctor continued to soar, all around him, the league was still struggling to lift its own fortunes. There was always that challenge of being the other league, not having the major television contract, not getting the notoriety. We were the NBA. We had the greatest franchises. We had the greatest players. The ABA was good basketball. It was fun basketball, but it wasn't the NBA. The war between the leagues was now nearly a decade old and the ABA was losing. By 1975, the American Basketball Association was a little bit like the Titanic after it hit the iceberg, kind of listing to the left and taking on water. There was a race. One that had the fastest car was probably going to get their checks cash first. As soon as they gave you a check, you rushed to the bank to make sure that the check was clear. We played the Utah one night, and. Uh, We've got to go to San Diego to play the next night, and all of a sudden, we can't go because San Diego folded. The ABA needs a profitable network television contract. It can't get that as the league now exists without merging with the NBA. So that means the alternatives for this league is consolidation or collapse. It sometimes seemed like the only thing breathing life into the ABA was his signature star. 
No matter how tired he was, he always had time for any reporter, anybody that wanted part of his time, he had time for them. He understood and felt the obligation that he had to try to help keep this league afloat. And nothing the doctor did would be more memorable than All-Star Weekend in 1976, when the ABA dreamed up another gimmick perfectly suited for his gifts. Good evening, everyone. This huge record-breaking crowd here at McNichols Arena about to bear witness to one of the most spectacular events in professional basketball, the slam dunk contest. The field included the highest flyers in the league. But even they knew there was only one guy to watch. For the New York Nets, the fabulous Dr. J. Julius Irving. I was going up against Doc. I ain't have a chance. I knew I had a chance. And now the doctor goes to work. Unbelievable. With each dunk that night, the show got better and better. And the greatest of them all would become a piece of basketball lore. Dr. J measured off from the foul line, then went back to midcourt. I didn't know what he was going to do, to be honest with you. He took off running with those short shorts, <laughs> and his afro was blowing in the wind. Just before the free throw line, he takes off, and bam! And that sets everyone really. Julius Irving! Before that, no one had seen that. First came the stunned silence, the gasp of disbelief, and then the roar of approval. And the winner, Julius Irving! It was bigger than I think what anybody thought it was going to be, you know, because 2013, we're still talking about it. So now how special was that? By that 1976 season, the ABA was on its last legs, eventually shrinking down to seven teams. Irving, oh, unbelievable. But Dr. J was still flying high, capturing his third scoring title, his third MVP and leading the Nets back to the finals, where they faced the talented Denver Nuggets. We had four great players. We had Dan Issel, Bobby Jones, Ralph Simpson, uh, Marvin Webster, myself. But they had Dr. J. He gets it over to the doctor. Time all game. Here's a shot, Julius. He, he scores! He scores at the buzzer, and the Nets win. Julius Serving finishes up with 45 points and a shot and stun crowd. Dr. J was amazing. Bobby Jones is the greatest defensive player ever to play the game, and Dr. J had his way. There is Julius Erving, and he has been the take charge guy. We knew where the ball had to go, and but no one had a problem with it. He just played tremendous. Look at Julius! Oh my goodness! He averaged almost 40 points a game, 15 rebounds, a lot of assists. He was really the difference in that series. Everybody's hugging and he poured champagne all over my head. Oh, it was just, it was just a tremendous celebration. It's the sweetest it ever was. I tell you, now hopefully this is, we've started something and we can keep on winning some more championships in the years to come. But we're going to enjoy this one right now. Have a little champagne. <laughs> Good party. <laughs> and then it was done. And then it was done. Let me say good morning to everybody. How are you doing? I'm Julius Irving. Haven't been in this building in a long time, but uh, it's kind of nice to be here. In the summer of 1976, pro basketball's two leagues at long last came together, with the NBA absorbing four ABA franchises, including the New York Nets. But in a cruel twist, Nets owner Roy Bow owed his new league millions of dollars in entrance fees and couldn't afford to keep the superstar who had kept his team and his league alive for so long. I kept telling Roy Bo, you can't do this. I mean, you know, you, we're never going to be able to replace this guy. It's like selling Babe Ruth to the Yankees. I called Billy Melchioni, and I did ask him, uh, is Julius Irving available? And Billy said no. Two weeks later, Billy called back, and he said, 
Julius Irving is available. I immediately called our new owner, F. Eugene Dixon, and he said, tell me, Pat, who is Julius Irving? I said, well, let me just describe him as the Babe Ruth of basketball. Julius, I welcome him with open arms to the door of the scene. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. Great to have you with us. The doctor had finally arrived in the NBA, but by now, all of pro basketball had seen better days. In 76, we needed help. The, the two leagues had battered each other to pieces, and, it, it, you know, the league was not healthy. After the epic Celtic dynasty of the 60s and transcendent stars and teams of the early 70s, basketball had seemed poised for a golden age. But instead, the perception of the sport had changed dramatically. The league was viewed as having too many African-Americans, being at the heart of drug issues, players being overpaid. In the 70s, people were afraid of all these things. White folks didn't know what to make of it. And sponsors didn't know what to make of it. Do I want to be associating my brand with this? And now there was an influx of new players from the league that glorified the playground. Letting in the sideshow of the ABA. Our business may have been bad, but the stubborn fans of the NBA said, well, we don't need those guys because they're not playing a real brand of basketball. But there was an undeniable curiosity about the biggest star of all making his debut. I want to see Julius Irving more than I've ever wanted to see any athlete in my life because you'd heard so much and he was supposed to be so different. I think everybody was saying, show us, show us. How good are you really? From UMass to Rucker Park, Virginia to Long Island, the exploits of Dr. J had long been a tall tale more than anything else. And now, in Philadelphia, he was about to prove that the hype was real. Where'd this guy come from? <laughs> you know, look at what he does out on the court. My God, you know, there was nobody like him. Doctor. Oh, that's incredible. Doctor's bad. Doctor is cold better. He was the cold better operation. Julius was like that bird coming in on the wing, swooping in, dunking on people. It was just something to see. The doctor with his magic shot. When you finally got to see this guy play, it felt like someone was giving you a gift. And Julius swoops to the middle. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Did he just do that? Really, did he just do that? I'm guarding him. And we were in Philadelphia at the time. Here's the doctor. Everybody up in the spectrum. All of a sudden, I see 18,000 people start to rise to their feet, and I'm thinking, like, oh, shit, something bad is about to happen here. <laughs> can go for the tie now. Irving maneuvers in. Julius has got it. That is the biggest play of the game. You would go back in high school and college and tell your teammate, did you see Dr. J yesterday? You didn't even remember what the score was. Did you see the moves that he put on? Doc just picked the ball up with one hand without even touching it with the other one. And windmill just the ball, like, like his arms stretched from over here all the way like a rubber band. Boom! The crowd went crazy. I can't believe that play! Me and Dad Dawkins over there, oh my, oh, did, did. we knew it was basketball then. Hey, have you ever seen anyone better than him? No, I haven't. He was the first guy I ever saw with air brakes. Air brakes. He was going to the basket straight, and all of a sudden, he said, Rrr! and started going sideways. How did he do that? I was like, you know, somewhat like a girl. Oh! 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 Never saw that before. The NBA had never seen a player like Dr. J or a team like the 76ers, whose supporting cast included George McGinnis, Doug Collins, and a brash pair of youngsters. And they all played like stars. 
There will be three who never met a shot he didn't like. And here I am. If you give it to me, I'm shooting it. When I was team, first guy got it, shot it. We play street ball. They are the Philadelphia 76ers, the greatest collection of individual talent ever assembled on one basketball team. And it would be the most talented player of all who changes game for the good of the group. Pat Williams, who was the GM, clearly said, look, we're going to be a better team. We don't need a guy to score 30 every night. We don't need a guy to dominate every night. We got stars on our team. And I accepted that. So many people ask, when will the real Dr. J show? So it doesn't bother you, the two guys you beat out in scoring in the ABA, Gervin and Thompson, have now passed you in the NBA. Well, the scoring is an individual statistic, and I think the objectives of the team are things that have to be paramount and have to come first. He didn't want to rock the boat. He was too nice a man to say, hey, I'm Dr. J, you know? But it worked. As the Sixers made it to the NBA Finals to play their polar opposites, the Portland Trailblazers. We represented the team game making the other people better. The 1977 finals were, were uh, almost a morality play in the eyes of a lot of people. This was the basketball world, the old world, taking a stand against these invaders and protecting the women and children from these, from these crazy people. And as the series began, it was best to hide the women and children. It goes to McGinnis quickly to the doctor. The doctor reemerged as if to show the basketball world who its best player was once and for all. To the basket. The came through. Portland's team concept looked to be no match for Irving's individual brilliance as the Doc powered the Sixers to a 2 0 series lead. Irving does he have time? He's there for But late in game two, everything would change. There was a division that created by that fight, and Portland used it as a rallying cry. Portland pulled together, and we pulled apart. Portland knew how to wait for the guy to come off, pass the ball. Another great pass by Walton. Wherein we were, hey man, get over there and get the ball. Well, what's wrong with you? I ain't passing to you no more. It was, it was a big difference. The Blazers stormed back to take the next three games of the series. The reeling Sixers faced elimination in game six. And the Doc responded with a finals performance for the ages. Walton there, Irving there. They meet at the top. Well, that's just two great players going against one another. And Julius won that battle. Julius roaring to the basket. And Julius is unbelievable. He never stopped coming at you. And there was this one moment where I thought I had him. The doctor out of there in a hurry. The doctor on the fly. The doctor with a window. He's got it. Julius Irving. Julius Irving. With 40 points, Irving carried the Sixers all night long. But in the closing seconds, they needed a basket to tie the score. 109, 107. Philadelphia with possession. We go to the huddle and. You know, guys are saying that they can beat their man. Philly coach Gene Shue would call the final play for George McGinnis. Here we go, the inbound of McGinnis. Drive, stop, pump, shoot, short, no goal, and the game is over! The Portland Trailblazers have won the World Championship. When the game comes down to the very end, how can you not Get the freaking ball in his hands. When the game was over, the doc said, uh, going over there to the other room and congratulating guys. And I looked at Darrell like, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm like, did you say you can go over there and congratulate these guys? <laughs> I want to go over there and fight. And he said, yeah, we're going to go over there, you know, and congratulate these guys. 
And we did. We did. Even in defeat, Irving's performance had been unforgettable. Even though the Trailblazers won that series, by the time that finals was played, Julius Irving was the star of the NBA. And for the remainder of the 70s, that star would rise higher than ever. Every time he came to town, that was the game to be at, the game where Julius Irving was playing. Playing against Dr. J, this would stop. Gonna tell you the story about Dr. J. He's taking his team all the way. He leads them through the NBA's. You know, when a phenomenon happens, a phenomenon happens. Land. It seemed like every Sunday you were on national TV playing somebody because people wanted to see the doctor. He was carrying the weight of the league on his shoulder. He realized he was an ambassador for the league. He was the ultimate ambassador for the league. The NBA supports Special Olympics. Why don't you? He was so senatorial. He was so gracious. There was nobody like the man known as Dr. J. Even as great as he is now, he's going to be greater. <laughs> Julius. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> appreciate that. It was always like Julius was so cool. The language was like, you know, indubitably. These rings are significant because they represent important associations. I remember I was so happy as a young black man who cared about language and presentation and image that Julius Irving sounded the way he sounded. Hey, hey, Dr. J. Where'd you get those moves? You move with such great major corporations decided that they wanted this guy to endorse their product. The idea that a black guy would be the face of a national brand, that was really radical. After years of underground stardom, Dr. J's popularity had exploded with a universal appeal that was unprecedented. I remember a lady saying, I would want my kids to grow up and be like the top. And these were white people, they were, you know, dark blacker than me. You know what I mean? These were white people. They were like, I want my kids to grow up to be like this man. And I was like, wow, man, that's, that's, that's some serious stuff right there. As the 1980s dawned, the journey that had begun in the Long Island housing project had taken Julius Irving to a Philadelphia mansion. Hi, Daddy. How you doing, guys? Hi, Dad. He and his wife, Turquoise, now had four children as they welcomed daughter Jasmine and son Corey to the family. We're having a lot of discussion in our house about, you know, the Kennedys who we admired. And from an African-American perspective, I mean, we wanted to be that type of family. And we were on what I thought was a pretty good course. Julius was every player's role model. So when the biggest college star in the country wanted some advice about leaving school early, there was only one person he wanted to talk to. I got him on the phone. I said, I'm trying to turn pro, thinking about it. You know, what's the pros and cons? And he said, look, come on out to Philly, and you can stay with me for the weekend. And I'm like, what? So I couldn't wait to get off the phone telling all my friends, I'm going to Philly. I'm going to stay at Dr. J's house. Back on the court, Dr. J was now the captain of a Sixers team that had been rebuilt around him. And while he no longer had his fro, he still had plenty of game. Irving is absolutely magnificent. In 1980, the Sixers returned to the finals to face the Los Angeles Lakers and the doctor's former house guests. Here's Julius. The doctor was in peak form as the Sixers fought to split the series' first four games. And he was never more breathtaking than on a play late in game four. Man, he did a move, which is the all-time greatest move I've seen. Magic and I were sitting there, and we were sitting right on the baseline. And when Dr. J left his feet, he didn't know what he was going to do. When we cut him off baseline, he started walking in the air. Got the ball in one hand. And we said, wait a minute, 
He's got to come down. There's no way he can stay in the air that long. 84 Sixers, and they get inside. And unbelievable. Julia Servic, fantastic move by the doctor. Jairus in the air, palming it with the right hand, floating, reaching, and spinning it in. Cooper and I said, <gasps> Should we ask him to do it again? We've never seen anything like that before. It was crazy. I didn't realize how long I had been in the air, but I knew I didn't have any legs left, but I didn't have any hang time left, so I fell on the floor. <laughs> Just another move. Julius had again left the mark like none other. But a few nights later, back in Philadelphia, it was Magic who upstaged the doctor in the Game 6 clincher. The most valuable player is Magic Johnson. He starts at center, plays forward and guard. Magic played every position, and they won a road game in Philadelphia that broke our hearts. From the time Julius arrived in Philadelphia, uh, any year we didn't win a title uh, was a failure. 1980 had marked the fourth season with Julius and without a championship. How many more IOUs are out there? We owed you one, we owed you two. When the hell are they gonna win something here? In 1981, Doc would be the league's MVP, but come up short again in the playoffs. This time to Larry Bird and the Celtics. And they have won the series! It's all over! The one thing that eluded Julius was winning a championship in the NBA, and here he was, uh, now taking a back seat to Magic Johnson out in Los Angeles and Larry Bird up in Boston. So many would say, well, you won in the ABA. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. That was a minor league. You got to win over here. At the end of the day, if you win a championship as an NBA player, it's on your chest forever. If you don't, you're always viewed as not quite a champion. In 1982, the Sixers would follow Julius back to the finals again. And again, they'd lose to the Lakers. The Lakers are the world champions. There's only so many times you can get near the top of the mountain and then not get over. Because if you're the man, you have got to be the man and overcome everything. It was great doubt that Julius would ever get it done. A lot of folks around the league began to say, great star not going to win a championship. I had a sense that the window was closing, and there's nobody to blame. You look in the mirror first, you say, what could I have done differently? But there was another viewpoint on Dr. J's inability to win it all, that it didn't all fall on his shoulders. It's not how good you are, it's how good your team is. And Dr. J's team just wasn't good enough. One of the things that you know we learned and, and that Boston obviously learned is that every single year you gotta compliment your stars by getting other players. I mean, you can't just have one guy. You know, he needed a little bit of help. They needed to get somebody with Julius. And they got the right man at the right time, a fellow by the name of Moses Malone. Like Julius, Moses had started in the ABA. And now, the dominant inside force would be Doc's partner and another chase for a title. In thinking about Moses, um, that's a dimension that I've never played with in a 12-year career. And here comes Philly. Moses Malone drops it off the dock and sends it up and in. They just complemented each other's talents so well. Julius, a dump off to Moses Malone. In the 1982-83 season, the Sixers would have far and away the league's best record. That goes up and champs it again. <laughs> if they won by 25, it was a bad night. And I mean, just crushing teams. And while Moses Malone ended up as Philly's top scorer, Dr. J still led the team in highlights. <laughs> and none would be more memorable in the late season breakaway against L.A. I was there when he had that, that famous dunk against the Lakers. Literally stole the ball right in front of me. It's gonna be stolen by the doctor. Yes, he's got it. Here he comes. Ray Rock 
Rocked the baby to sleep and slam dunk. <laughs> and the doctor made a sensational play. I can't explain it. I mean, it was just like this intense release of emotion. It was incredible. It was one of those moments as a kid that's just tattooed in my in my memory. The doctor made a sensational play. He rocked the baby and what a sleep. When Dr. J broke down the sideline, I was like, okay, this is my chance to make a great play against a great player. But that didn't happen, so I just said, you know, let me duck my head and get out of the way. Cooper just ducked the greatest dunk of all time. And you know what, if you're gonna get dunked on by anyone, why not let it be the best in the game? The Sixers and Lakers would meet again in the NBA Finals. And Philly, for a change, was not only the favorite, but also the sentimental choice. We had everybody against us. <laughs> the world was against us. I've never seen the country want to cheer for one guy because what he had meant to the league and what he had done for the game of basketball. There was barely ever any doubt as Doc and the Sixers swept Los Angeles. The Philadelphia 76ers finally the champion. It was such a relief, like a brick that was sitting over your head waiting to hit you and suddenly went the other way and now it wasn't there anymore. All have a special nod to Dr. J. Julius Irving, this has to be a great, great night for him. I saw like the jubilation on his face, just like, like relief, just we did it, we finally did it. He deserved it. Even though we would have loved to beat him again, you know, we would have loved to keep him in that pain. No doubt. Clean all those skeletons out of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah but you give those who really deserve it their just due when it's time. There you go, bro. I just remember I hugged him as tight as I've ever hugged anyone in my life. I was so happy for him. Get close together, Doc. Because if there was ever a player that deserved to have that one little piece that he was missing for his legacy, he had it now. Julius Irving was an NBA champion. It wasn't quite that easy. Because I've been trying to get here for seven years. Julius was no longer the kid with the crazy hair who changed the game. He was 33 now, old for a basketball player, even though on most nights, you never know it. But a new era had begun in the NBA, and he'd never get a chance at another title. And as the years continued to roll by, the final question in the career of Julius Irving was how long would it last? And in the fall of 1986, he let everyone know. Quite simply, I just notified the 76ers that I attempted this to be my last year in the NBA. And uh, one of the main reasons why was because I'm, I've been constantly asked this for the last three years. His time would give fans and players across the league a chance to express their thanks. We had to admire this man's athletic ability and above and beyond all of that, the man's class. It was like being around royalty. An elder statesman type class, dignity, it was pretty cool. A most respected and admired adversary whose great skill and competitive play has entertained so many for so long on the Boston Parquet. But no tribute was more emotional than the honor he received from his old ABA team. He was the ABA. He revitalized the NBA. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. J. It's it for Julius Irving. Where does he rank? In what kind of company? I don't know. Maybe Jesse Owens, Jackie Robinson, Joe DiMaggio, people like that. Dr. J had left the court. But even without him, he didn't have to look hard to see his likeness. That was for the fans. 
was Dr. J. Epstein. But the real Julius stayed out of the limelight, making special appearances now and then as the next generation of superstars made sure to pay their respects. Uh-oh, he's measuring off the free throw line. And Michael is backing all the way to the middle of the backcourt. Now the crowd lets you know what they think of it. I didn't know what to do. Then all of a sudden, I found the guy who started it all. Dr. J was sitting over there, he was looking at me, and he pointed, like going back and do the free throw line. The modern game Dr. J had shaped soared to new heights in his retirement and became a global phenomenon. But Julius Irving would return to the headlines in the spring of 2000, and not for a reason he or anyone else could have ever imagined. Nearly a month ago, Dr. J, Julius Irving's youngest son, Corey, was missing. He went out to buy bread for a cookout and did not come back. How do you live with this every day, Julius? It's the parent's worst nightmare. Uh, this is day 26 for us. Basketball great Julius Irving is offering a reward for help in locating his 19-year-old son. Five weeks go by. You're helpless. It was controlling our lives. Uh, this was this was it. This was the only thing that mattered. I just want him to come home or somebody to let us know what happened to him. And we're holding on and hoping that uh, it's going to turn up. Sad news this morning, a tragic discovery in Florida where authorities announced they believe they have recovered the body of basketball legend Julius Irving's missing son. Searchers found Corey Irving's car submerged in a pond near the Irving family home. There's a little deja vu. I lost my brother when I was 19. Now Corey was 19. Detectives say they believe the son of basketball legend Julius Irving simply took a fatal turn on his way home. It's like your guts are being ripped out. It's, there's an empty emptiness. It's the worst thing that ever happened in my life. The toll on our family was insurmountable insurmountable everybody dealt with it differently and i think the way that my dad deals with most things in his life is the way that he dealt with my brother passing in that you gotta pick yourself up dust yourself off and carry on with life and my mom wasn't prepared to do that it became very very difficult for us to relate to one another after that fact, and it wasn't a long period of time before we went our separate ways. when I see people 40 and 50. They haven't lost anybody. <laughs> Obviously, I can't relate to that, but I might not be as strong an individual as I am and, and have had the ability to endure the hard times uh, without those tragedies having happened. Anybody that would spend time with him would never imagine the loss that he's dealt with. But he has a positive spirit and energy. And as far as it relates to that legacy that is him, 
I think he's still creating it. I don't think it's done yet. There's something called essence. And essence, I think, is, you know, how you want people to feel about you. It's not that important that the whole world knows who I am and knows what I did. That's not how I function. To me, I mean, I like to keep the carrot out in front of me. I like to think that the best day of my life, the best time of my life is, is yet to come. He glances in the mirror and looks forward. Everyone else sees him and looks back. It's just one more contrast in the life of Julius Irving. Just one more complication of the impact of Dr. J, the singular performer and consummate teammate, the coolest superstar who ever lived, the father and brother forever grappling with loss, the pioneer who could get lost in history, the icon who so many still hold on to. The way in which commentators and journalists talked about this guy, Dr. J, was so much reverence. I'm like, I want to be Dr. B. You know, I was a kid, but I don't know that I'd be Dr. Boyd today were it not for Dr. J. You rock the baby and put it to sleep. Your hero is someone who inspires you. I look at that dunk. My wife thinks I'm crazy because I start to get a little teary-eyed. She's like, you're crazy. I go, this is, this is what has helped me, you know, achieve what I've achieved growing up in Philly and watching the great Dr. J. Everyone's got highlights. But after all of these years, you still go, wow. Who could have told that he would become one of the greatest players and people to ever step onto a basketball court? And will always be, no matter who comes behind him. That man is universally loved. This magnificent performer who had the ultimate gift. He made people happy. He helped young players like Larry and I understand that we had to be more than just a basketball player. When greatness meets class, that's what God created in Dr. J. He changed the game in ways that a lot of people don't really talk about. The simple fact, if you ever hear Michael Jordan talk, he always said he looked up and aspired to be like Dr. J. So if there's no Dr. J, then, you know, Mike would have never had someone to look up to. And if there was no Mike, then, you know, it was guys like myself who looked up to Mike. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see much of Dr. J when I was a kid and really didn't see a true creative player that a lot of people have spoken about. But when he left the game, he left with a lot of class and a lot of dignity and, and that respect from their peers. And that's something that if I don't even win a world championship or MVP or whatever, uh, that is something I would love to walk away from the game and have. There was a time in basketball, not even that long ago, when you weren't able to see the most exciting player in the world night after night on the court. So news got around by word of mouth. And tales were passed down from one generation to the next. So it's important to keep the greatest story of that era alive. That way, the legend can live forever. <laughs>